as the poet Porrick Fake's quixotic presence is becoming increasingly more understood as part of the history of Northern Irish writing. This series of atmospheric and poignant photographs taken by John Minahan since the 1980s plays crucially into this narrative of recognition. Viewing the portfolio of photographs brings me right back. Set mostly in the 1980s, there is an unforgettable mood-defining quality to John Minahan's vision of Creoc which embraces his essential solitude and his self-dramatizing, self-mocking presence, no matter the setting. I met a new fake, or Joe Connor, to give him his real name, from 1973. And during the 1970s, we visited him regularly in Glengormley. He also ventured forth to Galway, most memorably in 1976, to attend and give a reading at the second International ISL, as it then was, conference in UCG, now NUI Galway. But by the mid-1980s, I saw less of him until my late friend Edon McPullen, a key fake benefactor and supporter, and I decided to edit a new and updated edition of Joe's poems, since Terence Brown's important edition of 1979 was no longer in print. We spent quite some time getting this work together and in order for Blackstaff Press, who published Ruined Pages in 1994. It was an extraordinary few years leading up to the publication, and thanks to several local supporters and friends, and to John Minahan, who got Fake out and about again, Fake's drift into a kind of dangerous, itinerant existence moving from room to room, captured in many of these powerful photographs, was resolved. Finally, he would settle in the secure and caring environment of a residential care home in South Belfast in the 1990s, until his death in 2019. Fake could be infuriatingly and wearingly disruptive, and at his worst, destructive. But that was only an element of the personality, inflamed by distress and disappointment and the legacy of his vulnerable mental health. There was an emotional delicacy and care that the poems reveal, and a wicked sense of fun too, urbane, rascally New York Belfast wit, one-liners which could bring the house down. There was a touch of the genius buried within the self-pity and the recklessness. He could also produce moments of simple yet sublime calmness and intensity, reading his poems without frightening or alienating his audience. It's a magical quality we can see in these poignant and dramatic photographs of John Minahan's, in their time frame of barely 10 years from 1984, when John was introduced to fake by the Belfast writer and former Beirut hostage Brian Keenan to 1995, and that ironic portrait of Fake at the Adelstrop train station, setting for Edward Thomas's famous poem. These photographs reveal Fake as dramatically self-aware and quite comfortable before the lens, whether that be the averted gaze in a Dublin bar in 1989, or the somewhat angrier stare in his Cromwell Road rooms in 1984. As the decade progresses, Fig begins to look almost more at ease with himself, and the idea dawns that, but for the sturdy countryman DNA, who knows what might have befallen him. The bare essentials of his domestic life gather around the black and white soulscape of his inner life. The checked overcoat taking over from that, from what was his perennial three-quarter jacket, seen hanging on the back of his door. I remember that detail well. And the woolen ties, the cardigans, the fusty scarves, the scuffed shoes, as he walked in that awkward shuffling fashion, masking the bulky out of doors presence, which unbeknownst one could see from a distance. There wasn't a weakness of spirit in the poet as rendered in these photographs, in spite of the tellingly visible exigencies of his situation. 
There was a rootedness about Fake, something John's images point up quite starkly against the wistful, estranged, and at times tragic look of his demeanour. Fake could play games, sometimes cruel games, but it was himself that he hurt most. The fleeting, wry, and ironical smile says as much. As these stark photographs reveal, the poet is elusive, looking beyond the recognition of a sudden moment. Fake appears as he did in actuality, as still and contained one minute, and at another, fiery and unpredictable, capable of saying just about anything for the fun of it. There is no one like Fake. No one else could or should follow in his tempestuous and alarming footsteps along the abyss. But at long last it looks like the reality of his life and the meaning of his work are coming increasingly into critical alignment as the attention of younger scholars examine Fake's achievement in a detached and impartial manner. As John has remarked, Fake reminds him of the artist Francis Bacon and in his portraits of Bacon, William Burroughs and Samuel Beckett, John Minahan has produced his own canon of artistic excellence, to whom can be added, without any special pleading or distortion, Horrock Fake. An outsider most certainly, but one whose life was inseparable from his passionate, disputable art. Fake is a poet who belongs equally in the company and wider frame of European modernism as much as being read as a chronicler of the shocking local history of the northern conflict and its sectarian savagery. Fortunately, Fake was to reclaim and experience calm in the last couple of decades of his life. Alive, alive, oh, which conveys his mischievous and irreverent spirit, while touching upon his presence as the irascible outsider he could not help himself from being catches the spirit that lives on in the poems he spent a lifetime in making. The altar boy from a mass for the dead romps through the streets of the town, lolls on the brick-studded grass, jumps up, bolts back down with wild pup eyes. This morning a twist of winter to spring, small hands clutched a big brass cross, followed the stern brow of the priest encircle the man in the box. A bell-tossed head sneezed in a blue daze of incense on snivelled, bit lips. Then, just to stay awake, prayed too loud for the man to be at rest. Oh, now, where has he got to that climbed an apple tree? In his memory, I wrote this brief elegy, which I'd like to read in honour of Porrick Fake and of these images John Minahan has produced of his life and time. Leaves for Burning for Porrick Fake, 1924 to 2019. Are you spinning in your grave yet? More than likely, you've found a perch among the noisy blackbirds on a sparse tree where you can snipe from branch to branch, settle yourself and spot what else is going on, hither and yon. The boys who went down in the dark, the fine old lady everyone knew, and loitering there, amidst the Celtic crosses, someone's draining a can as the sky sweeps up high into the black mountain and down the other side to your garden. Look, just now, dead leaves for burning, and it's before all over again.